Russians and amen. Not Russia, but Russians. <laughs> and they are missionaries to my wife's country, South Korea. Amen. So uh, um, when uh, they send me a list of missionaries uh, coming into this way, and uh, I told my wife, there's a missionary in South Korea. She said, tell them, come on. So uh, she, she loves her country. She's a Korean American now, but she still loves her country. And for years, she wouldn't even apply for citizenship because she loved her country so much. And my kids had to convince her to get her citizenship. Amen. But she still got a Korean passport. That's right. <laughs> but uh, praise God. Amen. We are so thrilled to have the Russian here with us. And I want to turn the remainder service over to them. He's going to preach. He's going to tell us a little bit about Korea, whatever he want to do. Amen. Come on, Brother Russell. You may be seated. Sister Morrison's a great cook. I don't know if you guys are aware of that or not. But uh, she is a great cook, and we have enjoyed some of her food. And Brother Morrison took me out on the town to one of his favorite restaurants. And, you know, I told my wife about it. I said, you know, I was quite impressed with Brother Morrison, the way he went into that restaurant, and everyone knew him by name. And everyone was greeting him. They came by his table to speak to him. That speaks highly of the man of God, that he is a presence in his community so he's able to go forth and to win the laws for, the, for, for Jesus Christ so that they may know Jesus Christ as their salvation. You know, my wife and I, we... Uh, went to Korea as a fully appointed missionary in 2016. And when we arrived there, we lived in Seoul for a little while. It was about six months we lived in the city of Seoul. And Seoul is a very large city. The metropolitan area has 25 million people. And uh, there's about 13 of our churches at that time were in that location. And so we wanted to go somewhere that was unchurched. You see, Korea, is a, they do have a national work, a National United Pentecostal Church Korea there. But the country is about the size of the state of Illinois or Indiana. So it's a, a small for a country. But in that small country, there is 51 million people. Wow. And so we, we was in, in South Korea. And we said, we want to go somewhere where there is no church. There's already churches in Seoul area. We want to get out of the larger city. And so we started looking for a smaller city where the Lord would lay on our hearts to go. We took godly counsel and we spoke to others. We prayed about it. We went and we toured about four or five different cities that we had studied and was recommended to us. And we went to the city of Dajon. And Dajon was very much on our heart as soon as we got there. Uh, for one, the language program we was wanting to study was across the street from the apartments that we were looking at, the university that was there. But also, whenever you look at the road map of South Korea, you will have this... You blow up the highways themselves, and you will see this one point, and all of the roads go away from this one point. And when you make it a little larger, you'll see there's a traffic circle going around this one point, and all the roads go away from that area. And that area is Dajon, South Korea. If you're going anywhere in South Korea from top to bottom, east to west, you probably will go to the city of Dajon. And we was thinking about that. You know, if as we start planting churches in Dajon, as we start training individuals and they are, the Lord is filling them with the Holy Ghost, we can send them out on these little roads going different directions. And they can take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the various areas of South Korea. The national work there, we have about 38 churches and preaching points. That does change from day to day as preaching points are bound to do. But we have about 38. And so when you think about that, 38 churches and 38 preaching points, but 51 million, there's still a lot of work to be done in South Korea. When my wife and I, we arrived there in Dajon, we signed up for the university right away and we started studying the language. And many Chinese students from different countries, well, they will come to South Korea to get their degree. And when they study in 
a foreign country, they go back home, they have a, a, a higher opportunity to, to get a better job because they have an international degree. And my wife and I, we started school with many Chinese students. And after two years of studying, we would study for eight hours every day in the classroom setting, then go home and do our homework. Usually about 10 hours a day was what we would spend studying. And I turned to my wife and said, Monica, I said, all the other students are gone. They're studying for their degree. And you and I, here we are. I said, I, kill, I still can't ask where the bathroom is properly. How can I tell someone about Jesus Christ? And so I told her, I said, I've been doing a little research, and I have found that there is a community center here in town, very close to our house, that they offer a free language program that uses the same curriculum but at a slower pace. And free is always good for the missionary budget. And I said, why don't we start this free program? I said, it's only four hours a day. We can study for four hours. It will give us more time in the evening to start meeting people for language exchange so that we can practice what we have already studied. And so we started doing that. And Korean people, one of the, there, there's two questions they will ask. They will ask you, they'll say, why are you in my country? They, they're interested. They want to know why you're there. And so we're able to tell them we're missionaries here. And when they say, well, what does a missionary do? We think they dig wells. We think they provide food. Why, why are you here in South Korea? And we start to tell them about Jesus Christ and how we here to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ, how Jesus Christ can fill them with the Holy Ghost, how Jesus Christ can forgive them of their sins. The second question is, how old are you? They always want to know where they can put you at in the, in the Confucius structural philosophy where you rank. Should they be your mentor or should you be mentoring them? Or perhaps they can be your friend. And so we have met quite a few people for two years. We have been doing that and we have got a group together now that we're still individually meeting. But we have about 20 people who we are associated with men, wives, and their husbands, and their children. And, uh, and we want to pull them together at this point so that we can start having a church. And the church we're wanting to plant, we're wanting to have an international church. We want to come into the congregation, to the, the sanctuary. We want to sing songs in the English language. We want to turn around and sing songs in the Korean language. We want to study the Bible in the English language. We want to study the Bible in the Korean language at the same time, simultaneously. That way they get to practice their English and we get to practice our Korean and we all find out about Jesus Christ. We get the power of the Holy Ghost moving in these servants and the Lord can fill someone with the gift of the Holy Ghost. One of my friends, Igwang, I always like to tell testimonies of some of the friends that I have been meeting. I was meeting Igwang and he was probably the, the most beneficial to me in my two years of doing language exchange, the most beneficial to the acceleration of my language skill. And uh, I started meeting him very early in my time of meeting. Iguan, he, he, he came to me and he said, you know, I, when I, he asked me, was, what was I? I told him I was a Christian. Why was I there? He said, you know, my parents are Christians. I said, okay. I, he said, but they have not always been Christian. I said, okay, well, what, what do you profess to be. He said, I am nothing. He said, I don't believe in anything at this point. I said, well, okay. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, my, my family, we was raised as Buddhist. We would always go to the temple. We would always go and practice the Buddhist religions, the studying. Well, I don't know how the Buddhists worship. I don't know. He would say, we would practice the Buddhist religion. He said, but my parents, they came in contact with a Christian group and they, I was in my early adult years, and they decided to become Christians. They converted from Buddhism to Christian. He said, so I decided to start attending the church with them to see what the difference was. He said, and as I was attending these church services, I, I became very curious because I, I realized there was a great difference between the Buddhist religion and the Christianity religion. He said, and I wanted to know more. He said, so I started praying to God. He said, I would have a Wednesday night prayer meeting. They would come and meet together and do nothing but pray. He said, I was at that prayer meeting one night and I was praying. And I was praying the prayer, Lord, if you are real, I want you to show me you are real. That is a prayer to be prayed today that the Lord, he will show up when you pray that prayer. And he will let you know if he is real or not. And, and Iguan told me that while I was praying that prayer, I started to speak in another language I did not know. And I could not control it. I started speaking in this other language. He said, and I was just amazed. I did not know what was happening to me. He said, so after the prayer meeting had ended, I went to the service leader. He said, it was a lady who was leading the prayer service. And I asked her, I told her what had happened. And I asked her what was going on. 
And she told me, she said, let's not talk about that. She said, that was the Lord touching you, but that's nothing to worry about. Just keep praying and the Lord will lead you. He said, so I went back to the next week prayer meeting. I was praying, and again, the Lord started, he said, again, I started, he didn't say the Lord. He said, I started speaking in this other language as I was praying. And I went back to this lady. I said, it happened again. What is going on? I do not know. And she said, you do not need to ask me about that. You need to ask the pastor. And so it was, he went to the pastor, and he asked the pastor. And the pastor said, I have heard that you have been having this experience. He said, but you keep asking questions about it. He said, if you're going to keep asking questions, do not come back to this church. Go somewhere else. That's what he said. He said, and so I became very disheartened with Christians at that point. And I could feel the Holy Ghost welling up on me as he was telling me the story. And it was the Holy Ghost was in this room. I said, Iguan, I said, let me tell you what happened to you. And I started telling him how he had repented of his sins. And the Lord has washed his sins away. And for that reason, when he opened himself up to Christ, that the Lord was moving in his body and it filled him with his spirit and was making him a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm still working with Iguan. I do believe that Iquan will be a great member of the Pentecostal church in Daejeon, South Korea. Because when my wife and I arrived, there was no apostolic voice. There was no Pentecostal church. And the Lord is playing a church through people like Iquan. We have friends that the Lord is working through. And we are ready to get back to South Korea. We came in in November the 29th of 2019. We started traveling Three months into our travels, COVID hit. They shut us down. We could not travel no more. We were scheduled to leave in September of this past year. They said, if you're not by September, you will for sure be gone by December. We're still here. I need this church to pray for my family. There is a work that the Lord is doing in South Korea. There is a city of two million people. Dejan, the metropolitan area, even though it's a small city, it's two million people. And there was no apostolic voice. And currently, there's still no apostolic church. We want to get back to pull that group together so there will be an apostolic church in that city that so desperately needs Jesus Christ. We ask you to pray that the Lord will speedily allow us to return, will, will bless us so that we can get back there. And I ask you to pray for South Korea, to pray for the city of Dejan. There's people like Iqua in various places all over that nation. We just have to find them. We have to tell them what God is doing. And they are already filled. And they just need to know what's going on. We ask you to pray for us because that's the way the Lord is planning a church in Dejan. And we're ready to see that church be there. At this point, I want us to go to the uh, preaching part of the message. The brother got up here and he basically preached my message. I don't know if I should just sit down or pick up the loose ends that he didn't do, so I, I think I'll just pick up the loose ends. Turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Whenever I preach, I like to use a lot of scriptures. The reason for that is I'm not a good preacher. And so therefore, I just read the word and we'll let the word of the Lord speak to us. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. In the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. And he, we're speaking of Jesus, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and they say unto him, Master, carest thou not whether we perish? And Jesus, he arose and rebuked the wind, and he said unto the sea, Peace be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared his ceiling, and they said one to another, What matter of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Today I am going to preach to you a question. And the service this morning has went hand in hand with this question I am going to ask. And that question is, 
Who is Jesus to you? So let's lay our Bibles down. Let's lift our hands to the heavens. Let's ask the Lord to bless the remainder of this service. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for meeting here with us already today. We thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Ghost that is in the house, Lord. Lord, I ask you to reach down and to touch each and every ear that is here so that we may hear the word that you had to speak to your church today. Lord, I ask you to anoint these lips of clay that I'm able to speak clearly, Lord. Allow me to be that conduit that you could flow through this day, Lord. Lord, I, let you, I ask you not to allow your word to return into you void, but let it accomplish that what you have set it for to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's give a hand clap of praise to Jesus. You may be seated. Now that I have been studying language, I have been noticing some very interesting things. Before, when we were on deputation, we would go to every state of this union, and every state of this union has a different accent. There's a different way that when you hear them, you know automatically, and, and I actually became very good at it. I could hear someone talk. I said, that person is from Ohio. That person is from Tennessee. That person is from Kentucky. And there for about six months or so, maybe up to a year after we had gotten off a of deputation, I still had that ability. And, and I, I, it was just amazing. As I started studying language, I started to understand more of what was going on. Yeah. You see, whenever we talk, we, when we learn language, we learn speech patterns. And, and we learn to, to formulate these words and to put these words together to form a sentence. And whenever I'm, I'm from Mississippi, and we say things, my wife is from Oregon, and she moved to Mississippi after we were married, and we would say things, and she'd say, what are you even saying? I don't even understand what you're saying whenever you say the words you say. And it's a speech pattern because we string our words together. Yeah. Interesting side note there, when I was, right before we left Korea, I was studying level four and level five, which is the, the upper level of the Korean language, and I was starting to study the speech pattern of the Korean language. And it was so interesting. And I, and I started to realize we all have these speech patterns. Yeah. And so whenever I read this statement, I'm from Mississippi. And so my, whenever I read it, it may sound different than when you read it. And it said, the same day when the evening was come. And so we go and we read this account of Jesus Christ. He rebukes the wind and he tells the storm to cease. And, and the disciples are amazed. But on the same day when the evening was come, all this happened. This tells me in my mind that something happened earlier in this day that almost makes this account where Jesus rebukes the winds pale in comparison. And so I said, what could have happened earlier in this day that when Jesus Christ rebuked the wind and the storm ceased, that it pales in comparison to what happened earlier? What could equal that? And so I went to my Bible and I started looking for this day. I, I, I was trying to find the, the, the morning of this day. And I found it. It's in Mark chapter 3 at the very latter part of this chapter 3. If you want to read it later at home, you can do so. But Jesus Christ and his disciples woke up and it was a Sabbath day. And they decided we're going to the temple, which was their custom. And they were going to hear the word of God being read. And so Jesus and his disciples started making their way toward the synagogue. And as they are walking, his disciples are hungry. They might not have eaten anything the night before. I don't know the situation, but they're grabbing corn, ears of corn, off the stalks growing. And they start eating the raw corn as they're walking toward the temple. And as they walk up, the priests, the Pharisees, are standing there greeting the people as they come in. And they see the disciples eating this corn. And they say, Jesus, how is it that you're disciples, you're allowing them to eat the corn, and it's the Sabbath day. You're not supposed to do that type of work on the Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. And Jesus, he asked them a question. He said, when King David was fleeing the wrath of Saul, uh -oh. he went into the temple, and the, the high priest gave of him the shoe bread, and he ate it so that his strength would be sustained, so that he might not be overtaken and killed by Saul, was the priest wrong? Was David wrong to eat the shoe bread? They couldn't answer him because David is their most highly respected king. And they, they could not say David was wrong. Even though David was not a priest, legally, he was not able to eat that shoe bread. And so they go into the temple. Jesus and his disciples they find the place and they're sitting there. And all eyes are on Jesus. Everyone knows Jesus. He's, he's of a nor notoriety around town now. He heals people. He speaks these great parables. And everyone wants to know what's going to happen when Jesus is there. Oh, yeah. 
And as they are sitting there in the back door of the synagogue walks a man with a withered hand. Yes. You see, my dad has had a stroke in his very limited use of his right hand. And so whenever I read this passage here about the man with the withered hand, I can picture my dad walking in with a withered hand and a withered leg. He goes into the church and he sits down into the synagogue and all eyes see this withered man and they turn to see what is Jesus going to do. They know that Jesus is the one that when he sees a need, he's not one to let that need go untested. He's going to stand up and say, you are healed. And he's going to cast out demons. He's going to heal the sick and open blind eyes. And they say, what will Jesus do now? Because he's in the synagogue and it's the Sabbath day. Jesus, he knows the thoughts of the scribes and the Pharisees as they are thinking the same question. He turns to them and he asks the question. He said, is it lawful to, be, to do good on the Sabbath or evil? They don't say a word. They don't answer that question. So he asked them again. He said, is it lawful to save a life or to take a life? They cannot say a word. And Jesus Christ, he turns to that man. He said, stretch forth your hand. And that man stretches forth that withered hand and automatically he is healed as the power of God moves upon his body. And Jesus has spoken that word and the healing takes place in his body. And then something very interesting happened. The scripture points it out. The scribes and the Pharisees, they start to consult one with another about killing Jesus Christ. And the scripture says that it's the first time they made mention of killing Jesus. That's pretty important. Jesus is just like you and I. He's a man. People start talking about killing us. We usually don't stick around. Jesus gets up and he exits the back door. He, he makes his way out. And I can just imagine that, well, I'm pretty positive one man who had just been healed probably followed Jesus out. But I can imagine the majority of that church follows Jesus out. And Jesus starts making his way down to the coast. He's going to the sea, and the people are thronged about him. The scripture tells us that he is, he is surrounded by people who are there to hear the parables he's going to teach. They're there to bring their sick so that Jesus may heal them. They're, they're bringing the demon possessed so that Jesus can cast out the demons. And, and they, they're wanting to know what is going to happen the rest of this day. And as Jesus is there with those that throng of people on the coast. He's teaching parables. He's casting out demons. He's healing the sick. He's opening blind eyes. He's healing the lanes so that they may walk. And then he turns to his 12 closest friends. This is the same day. He says, I am going to ordain you so that you can go out and heal the sick and cast out demons yourself. And so Jesus prays for his 12 closest friends, his disciples. And he gives them the power of the Holy Ghost upon them to go forth and work the same miracles that they marvel when Jesus does. Now they have the authority to do that. And then he tells that group of men, he says, let's go in a ship to the other side. They get in the boat. They start making their way to the other side of the sea. These are experienced sailors, majority of them. Yeah. And a storm arises. It's a bad storm. It's a very bad storm because we have Peter. We have all these, we have John. We have all they are experienced fishermen. They're used to this very sea. And a storm arises and it starts to beat against the ship. And the waves, they start to come into the ship and the ship is now full. They're afraid it's going to sink. And they say, we're going to die. Someone, we are not able to make it to the other side. Someone wake up Jesus and see if he can do something to save us. So they go and they wake Jesus. Jesus stands there and he rebukes that storm. Peace comes. Then he turns to his disciples. He said, why were you afraid? You just seen the works I have done. You just heard the message I told you. Let's go to the other side. You yourselves had just been ordained, you could have rebuked this wind yourself. I found something interesting about that. It was when, even though they were accustomed to walking with Jesus daily, they were accustomed to the miracles, it was when the storm hit their ship, they was wondering, who is Jesus to us? Amen. And so with that thought on our mind, I want us to look at some scriptures in the Bible. 
And I want us to think to ourselves about the storms of life that we have been through. Every one of us have been through storms in this life. If you are here and you say, I've never been through a storm, well, you just better sit back and buckle your belt because a storm's coming. You're going to face a storm. And you need to know who Jesus is to you when that storm hits. So I want us to look at the scriptures. I want to go through some miracles where Jesus has done mighty works. These works are so great that they are put in this holy book so that we might read, we might take note from them. Turn with me first to Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 15. Matthew 8, verses 14 and 15. When Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them. Here in this first example I have chosen, Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. You see, Jesus and his disciples, they were making their way through the land, and they was hungry, they was tired, and Peter said, hey, we're close to Mama-in-law's house. Why don't we turn in there? She's usually good about cooking us something to eat, and she'll let us rest, take a break for a little while, then we'll